period and, and commencement every spring. Um, and, and so there is a rhythm to our lives, and, um, and it's important, I think, to, to think about, the, the, to, to stop and think about um, certain events and what they mean in the life of the college. And um, for, me, for me, it's really about remembering what it is that we really do here. And in my book, uh, the way I would describe that is that what we do here is that we exercise hope. That college is so oriented toward the future that I don't think there's a better way to describe it than to say that we are fundamentally in the business of hope. And um, that's what we should stop and remember at any, any occasion that we have to stop and remember it. Um, and so this is a time of reflection and this is a time of uh, remembrance. And before I go any further, I, I would like to take this opportunity to, to remember that I am not the only one retiring from Maryville College this spring. Uh, my colleague, Lori Schmid, my colleague, Larry Irvin, both retiring. Um, I am, um, uh, I'm gonna miss them like I'm gonna miss all of you and I know you're all gonna miss them as well. We also have other, you know, Anne is leaving, Anne McKee is leaving, Kristen Gorley is leaving, uh, not retirements. But again, it just, this is, these are the ways that we mark time. Um, and so occasions like today allow us to sort of check our pulse, to remind ourselves of what it is that we really do here, whether we are as prepared and poised for the future as we can be, um, whether we're prepared to continue as an exercise of hope. Um, so that's kind of where, where I'm coming from at the beginning here. But I also speak today in profound gratitude. This college and this community have given me so much over the past 24 years. Personally, and maybe most importantly, this is the community that taught me how to grieve. But this community has also given me deep friendships, intellectual challenge, and intellectual formation. This college is giving me meaningful work. It's giving me very satisfying interactions and relationships with, with uh, some of the most amazing people that I've ever encountered. Um, and one thing that I have said before, uh, in contrast to the title of this uh, talk, one thing I've said before is that being a college professor is just a really neat way to stay in school forever. Um, and I, 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 uh, I think that struck a nerve, right? Um, it's really an excuse to just keep studying and learning. And of course, there are learning opportunities everywhere. But I have learned so much from my faculty colleagues, I've learned from the small groups, faculty groups that I've been a part of over the years, particularly those groups that are focused on particular uh, courses like first year seminar and, and ethics, uh, just getting together with the faculty that teach those courses and exploring ideas and, and um, you know, throwing ideas out and seeing what sticks. Tremendously beneficial, tremendously educational I have learned maybe even more from committee work, various committees that I've served on over the years. Um, it's all been, you know, sometimes committee work is a grind, um, but it's always, in the end, it always um, has done good things for me. It has always enlarged my mind. Um, I've learned quite a bit from various dimensions of faculty governance. And I think this is one of the most prized, the things that I prize about Maryville College is the, the self-governance of the faculty and the, the, the um, responsibility that we take on in terms of self-governance. Um, I learned a whole lot from teaching interdisciplinary courses with uh, faculty outside of any of the business or even social science disciplines. And I've learned so much from my students. 
Um, and it's hard to really, you know, even sort of talk about what you've learned from your students because you often, I don't often realize it until long after they're gone. <laughs> It's like, um, you know, the, the sort of ongoing daily interaction with students, you're learning and you're growing, but you don't really stop to, to, to sort of reflect on that until a semester is over or until someone's graduated. Um, so to all of my current students that are here and all of my past students, um, let me say a special thank you to you guys. Um, you've made me wiser, you've made me more patient, You've made me more, um, more, you have expanded my horizons. Um, you know, I've heard thoughts come out of your mouths like I would never, it would have never occurred to me, things that would never have occurred to me. And of course, you know, one of the biggest things I've learned from my students is not to be a um, technology Luddite, right? Um, it's because of my students that I even know how to file share. Um, because, right, I would ask them to email assignments to me and they don't do that, right? They just share the file and they just expect me to get with it. So, you know, my ability to go back and say, no, yes, you sent it to me as a Google Doc, but I need an email. <laughs> um, that just doesn't work anymore. Um, I had an experience this past semester where I had a particular class of students working in small groups and I had asked them to prepare a PowerPoint in their small groups uh, that we could then bring back to the class and, and share and let them talk about their, the ideas that they had on their PowerPoint. And normally, I do, again, normally I do that by asking them to email me those PowerPoints right in the middle of class. But for some reason this morning, that particular morning, I thought, I'm going to use a thumb drive. And, you know, I'll just give the thumb drive, take it around each group, and they can put their, their PowerPoint file in the thumb drive. The very first group I go to, I give the thumb drive to one of the young women in the, in the class, and she just stares at it. <laughs> she had no idea what to do with it. She had no idea where to even plug it into the computer. I said, plug it in. She's... And then another student in her group looks over and says, I haven't seen one of those since grade school. <laughs> so now I know, right? Um, so, so this college has enriched me um, uh, immeasur immeasurably. Um, and that's, that's one of the primary ways why, uh, reasons why I love it. So as I mentioned earlier to one of my former students, you know, some of you guys out here are leaving the college after two years of study or three years of study or four or five, maybe. But I'm leaving after 24 years, so <laughs> it's taken that long, but, but I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, many of you in casual conversations over the last several months Many of you have asked me what I'm going to do uh, in retirement. And um, you know, one of my responses to that is that uh, of all the things uh, that I could possibly be thinking about, that's not one of them. I, I'm not at all concerned about what I'm going to do in retirement. Um, maybe that's um, ignorant on my part, but um, I, you know, I feel like um, I have been tremendously blessed. I have a very rich life. Uh, we have had opportunities to do lots of things, to travel. Um, so, you know, I think uh, what I'm going to do in retirement is still many of the same things that I've been doing for a long time. Uh, and, and fortunately, a lot of that revolves around uh, family. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that's really probably going to, if there's going to be a focus to, to my retirement, um, that's probably what it is. But I do have to also say that this is hard, that there are many ways, I, yes, I'm ready for retirement, but um, this hurts to say goodbye, um, even though I'll be around for a few more weeks. Um, but I choose to, to look at that as a measure 
uh, of just how important the work we do here is and just how valuable the work is that we do here and um, just how valuable uh, being a part of this community has been. Um, so uh, we're going to, let me just say a couple of things, uh, sort of logistical things. Um, you know, at the end of my, uh, my remarks, we're going to go across the plaza to the atrium uh, for cake and hugs, if anyone is so inclined. Um, and I am incli inclined, so. Um, but this is, I also want you to know that some of my family is here, the family that's so important to me. Uh, Pat, for sure, is here. Uh, many of the kids, uh, some of the grandkids. Um, and so um, I really would like to take a few minutes of your time, since this is something I've really never talked about in, in any class that I've been in, I'd like to introduce you to some of the family, if that's all right with you guys. And I'm going to start with a couple of pretty special guests, but I'm going to start with this guy. All right, um, this is my great-grandson, Bowie. And some of you know that Bowie was born December 5th at uh, 24 weeks and has spent most of his life, or, or the last four months of his life, in a NICU unit down in Nashville. Came home uh, March the 10th, and he is doing great. And I see him right back there, so... Um, you might want to keep your distance from him a little bit because of his fragility, but um, I am so thrilled that he's here, and um, I'm going to hold him later on today. But along with Bowie, we also have um, um, my granddaughter, my newest granddaughter, Zoe. So we have Bowie and Zoe here. And I don't know what, if that means there's a trend in the family in terms of what we're going to be naming future uh, grandkids or great-grandkids, but I'm delighted that both of these guys are here. And, uh, and I'll just introduce you to the rest of this sort of youngest generation in the family, because there's too many other folks otherwise. So uh, this is Timothy, a great-grandson, and his older sister, Ridley. And we... <laughs> Zoe figured it out. This is, um, this is another really uh, heartwarming uh, baby picture. But this is Stetson. And Stetson is holding on to his dad's fingers. Uh, so this was when he was a newborn. Uh, this is Stetson's older brother, Woodrow. <clears throat> and we have more. This is Abby, this is Zoe's older sister, right? She's the one in charge. <laughs> this is three more great grandkids, Chris and Jane and Jake. And I, you know, I, I put these pictures in here hoping that they would all be here and I'm not sure that they are or if they'll arrive later. Uh, but, you know, this was their chance for fame, so. <laughs> Maybe they missed it. And then maybe one more, right? Yeah, so this one even has me in it. But these are my two uh, grandkids that live in Japan. And uh, these are my three grandkids that live in Charlotte. Um, so they're hanging out in Washington, DC. Um, absolutely not plotting any sort of insurrection. <laughs> so thank you for <laughs> indulging me with that. Um, I'd like to, to, to say a few words about the tradition of last lectures. I'm well aware of the tradition started in the, in the um, what, mid-2000s um, with a particular professor from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and the idea was, uh, is that uh, this is an opportunity, the last chance for any particular professor to tell, to, to, to speak to students about the, the things that he really wants them to hear um, before he or she retires. Um, and uh, we have had that tradition here uh, at the college. And in my mind, that tradition dates back to Dave Powell. 
and I could be wrong about that. Um, my memory is, is uh, always suspect. But um, that's my first recollection of a, of a last lecture. Uh, Dave, um, if I remember right, he parsed the college's statement of purpose almost word by word, and as only Dave could do. And um, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Um, but Sherry, I remember her last lecture, um, and that was a model for, in some ways, for what we're doing today. Um, Terry Simpson, of course. Um, so we do have a tradition of this kind of last lecture. And um, when I started out to, um, to sort of plan this and think about, uh, so what do I want to say in, in, uh, given this opportunity? And I ended up, uh, you know, on the title, Things Not Yet Said. And, you know, after I sort of rolled that around in my mind, I thought to myself, that's actually a pretty cool title. Um, because you don't have no idea what that means. <laughs> um, you know, it's kind of like, what's he going to say? Is he going to say, you know, what has he been holding in for 24 years? That, that is now just going to erupt on stage in public and live stream. Um, so I'll just let you know that it's nothing like that. Uh, the, the explanation for the title is actually very pedestrian. Um, but I kind of, I kind of, you know, didn't want to give that away. Um, so where it, where it came from was, um, you know, I was asking myself, uh, what would I want to say given this opportunity? And I thought about it in terms of speaking to students, and, um, and, I, and I realized that over the course of 24 years, I have taught many different uh, catalog courses. And I have not had a lot of opportunity, and that's perfectly okay, not a lot of opportunity to um, you know, create experimental kind of courses or test things out, or as we would say among the faculty, 349 courses. Um, so, from time to time over the last 24 years, I have felt a bit like there are lots of other things besides the standard catalog courses that are interesting to me and important to me and that I like to talk about. But they just never sort of seem to uh, fit, never seem to be appropriate in any particular class. There's not a lot of those things, but there's a small number of things. And I thought, you know, what, that, what those are are the things that I just haven't had a chance to say uh, over the course of teaching. So uh, I want to just speak a little bit about some of those things, things that are important to me, uh, things that I think are important to us, and, but things that just never, um, never came out in a particular uh, classroom environment. So in the course of doing this, it's going to be part reflection, part reminiscent, uh, part commentary, um, maybe a few anecdotes here and there, um, but just things that I say, things that are interesting to me that haven't been a part of my, um, uh, haven't really fit well in, in, in most of the courses that I teach. But let me also say that, you know, yes, this is the last lecture, but for my current students in my current classes, take that figuratively, not literally, right? We still have two more weeks to go, so. So, what do I want to talk about? Well, I already mentioned Dave. Dave Powell, excuse me, and his um, uh, conversation about this, the college's statement of purpose. And I, you know, I have actually used that statement of purpose in a class. So here I am, you know, this is, this is old stuff. But in my international business class, when we start to study culture, we talk about um, country culture, there's a particular model of culture that argues that, um, first of all, that, that, that culture is, one definition of culture is shared values. Uh, but this particular model of culture argues that if you go visit another country, if you go to a country or a place that you've never been before, you don't see the values. You see what we call artifacts. 
right? Artifacts are the things that you see, touch, taste, smell, feel um, when you're in a different culture. And it's those artifacts that are clues to what that culture values. So I sort of flipped that as an exercise in my international business class. And I put up this list, OK? And this is a list that I distilled from the mission statement, the statement of purpose, um, the covenant, uh, maybe one or two other places. Um, but this was actually kind of um, a shock to me when I compiled this, right? This is a pretty healthy list of values. But in those documents, this, these are the things that we say we value as a community, right? We value truth. We value wisdom. We value justice. We value liberation. We value respect. We value discriminating aesthetic taste, which of course we can't measure, but we value it. We value knowledge, teaching, relationships. So I'm not going to go through all of this, all right? Um, but I put this up here just as a way of sort of, um, you know, framing the debate, uh, not the debate, but uh, the framing my comments about um, the things that really make this college special, that really makes this college um, su such a, 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 a valuable uh, community. And um, I don't think it hurts to reflect on this periodically, right? To ask ourselves about these particular values. And the question I ask my students is, imagine an extraterrestrial lands on the college campus. How would such an extraterrestrial detect that these are our values? And that's a really interesting, that's a hard question for students sometimes, right? So I'm not going to go any further with that except to pose it for you guys, right? How do we exhibit these values? How does a, how would a stranger uh, figure this out, right? Um, so keep that in the back of your mind because what I really want to talk about is the college's mission statements, okay? It's a lot shorter than the statement of purpose. So for those of you that, uh, well, I'm sure you all have this memorized, right? Maryville College prepares students for lives of citizenship and leadership as we challenge each one to search for truth, grow in wisdom, work for justice, and dedicate a life of creativity and service to the peoples of the world. So I think there's some, you know, pretty kind of obvious and maybe uh, casual kind of observations that I'd like to make about this particular uh, mission statement. First of all, right, it suggests that there's a particular kind of life that we think is worth living. Right? A life of creativity and service. Um, there's no other life that we have described anywhere in our documents like this, right? So this must be important. This must be worthwhile. This must be valuable, right? That, that all of us live a life of creativity and service. The second thing, the observation that I might make is that such a life is somehow connected to searching and growing, and also somehow connected to truth, wisdom, and justice. So I don't know that there's any reason to sort of add any commentary to that. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And you know, we could probably spend an hour or so kind of, all right, so just what is the connection between searching and growing and truth and wisdom and a life? of creativity and service. But for the moment, we can leave it just as it is. Another casual observation I might make is that according to the mission statement, such a life requires preparation. None of us are born ready to live that kind of life. It requires that we prepare. And I think here we refer to this preparation as 
a liberal arts education. This is really what I think is going on in the mission statement, that the way that we prepare students for this life of creativity and service is the education that we provide them, the liberal arts ed education that we provide them. So yes, right, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about liberal arts. But I might also say um, that we could also refer to this as the liberal arts experience, right? Because sometimes education uh, narrows our sort of perspective. And, and really, attending Maryville College uh, is an experience. And it is a liberal arts experience. Uh, and it's a way of saying that you know education happens, uh, doesn't just happen in classrooms, but it happens across the entire campus. It happens in athletics, it happens in the theater, it happens in music, it happens um, in the college woods, it happens in Cades Cove, um, it happens in just hanging out with, um, uh, with other people, right? Um, so I think it's fair to say that it's the liberal arts experience that is the preparation for living this particular kind of life. Um, one last casual observation. Right? My reading of the mission statement is that, you know, given that this is about living a particular kind of life, it means that this particular education, this preparation, this experience, is supposed to be put to use. Right? So there is, and um, you know, I guess I could say utility. There is, um, there is, there is a purpose for this, right? Um, the liberal arts experience is for something beyond whatever value it has in and of itself. It is also for a particular purpose. It is purposeful. And if we look at the last part of the mission statement, it is for someone, right? It's not just kind of generic, right? It's for um, living this life of, of creativity and service is for all the peoples of the world. My translation of that is it's for everybody, right? So there is nobody outside the scope of the way we, uh, or for whom we should live our lives if that makes any sense. And I think that's actually um, pretty profound. Um, but I also think there's some deeper meanings, right, that we can um, play around with. And I may have to hurry a little bit to get through the rest of this, because after all, there's cake waiting. <laughs> but another observation that I would make about our statement of purpose, the first uh, sort of deeper observation right, is that it must be possible. In other words, it must be possible for us, our students, to live such a life, right? It must be possible for humans to live lives of creativity and service. Why? Well, because if it wasn't possible, then we're all here on a fool's errand. And uh, that's not true. <laughs> I know that we're not on a fool's errand because I know we have alums and we have current students and we have faculty that are, in fact, living lives of creativity and service. So this is not some pipe dream. This is possible. All of us can do this. OK? But I also wonder if this idea of um, purposeful, a purposeful life, a life of creativity and service, if it could become in some ways more of a touchstone for our community. And um, what I mean by that is, um, could we um, ask ourselves from time to time, as we contemplate decisions, as we contemplate curriculum changes, as we contemplate new majors, as we contemplate course changes, as we contemplate QEPs. <laughs> that's, a, that's a sort of an inside joke. <laughs> um, 
As we contemplate new athletic programs, as we contemplate new buildings, right, to just include in our deliberations, how does this curriculum change? How does this new program, how does this new major, how is it going to help anybody live a life? How is it going to prepare them to live a life of creativity and service? How does that fit into our uh, deliber del deliberations? Or even if somebody um, studies these things, these new things, how does it help them in their work life, in their professional life, how does it help them live a life of creativity and service? And I think that if we were to sort of just, and I'm not saying you know we make all our decisions that way, but if it becomes just a touchstone in our deliberations, it might enlarge our thinking beyond uh, the sort of narrow focus we tend to get in terms of measurement and assessment uh, and, and those kinds of things. Um, the third thing, the third sort of deeper meaning I might uh, suggest is that as a community of work, we, I think, need to model this, this kind of life. We need to model a life of creativity and service. Um, you know, I've already talked about education taking place uh, outside the classroom, it takes place on the athletic field, it takes place playing your instrument, it takes place volunteering somewhere, it takes place even if you go out and drink a beer with your friends, right? But it also happens in every institutional transaction and every institutional interaction with each other, right? The, 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 um, the learning. We are a community of work. Things need to get done. So we do have job descriptions. We do have policies, rules, right? But if we expect our students to go out and uh, live a life of creativity and service, it seems to me that we should do the same. We should model it. In fact, they should experience it. Right? I, would, I would like to see our students go out, and some of them do, go out and go to work at different places, and they come back and say, this place I'm working at is really screwed up. <laughs> because Maryville College is different. And I think uh, we can do even more of that. Um, as an organizational scientist, I know that the way the organization function, uh, functions um, drives people's behavior and teaches people. So uh, they need to see this life of creativity and service and action across our institutions. Um, lastly, um, and maybe most importantly, I'm going to argue that this mission statement embodies a liberal arts ethos. Um, because, as I said at the beginning, this is possible at the beginning of this part, this is possible. We know this is possible. So our mission statement is, in fact, a tremendous testament to human capacity, right? It is an affirmation of human capacity. And since the preparation for that kind of life is the liberal arts experience, the liberal arts themselves are a wonderful affirmation of human capacity. And I think this is the highest and best thing that we can say about liberal arts. It reifies and affirms human capacity and therefore human dignity. At the end of the day, the mission suggests that we work to uphold and celebrate human dignity and the mutual respect that accompanies human dignity. So in the end, let's see, I think I had, yeah, I had all that written down <laughs> in the slide. Um, so um, in the end, it's all about people. It's all about other human beings and our capacity, individually and collectively, to accomplish, to live uh, this kind of life, to deliver on this mission statement in our own lives. And this is what one of the things that's been a very sort of constant idea and constant theme in my work here, um, but again, largely unspoken because um, it doesn't fit into a international business class or a principles of finance class. So I wanted to sort of close with um, just to kind of brief you on an exercise that I used when I very first, uh, when I interviewed here 24 years ago for the open position in strategic management. 
So I walked into Thaw 201, and it was exactly the same as it is today. No different. Uh, maybe the desks are changed, maybe. But I, asked, uh, I walked in, and, and I asked the students to make a name tent. So I, I gave them a sheet of 8.5 by 11, told them to make a name, name tent, so I could call them by their names. Right? And they knew how to make a name tent. And I had to tell them that I had done this exercise with CEOs, and the CEOs had no idea how to make a name tent. So they never came to Maryville College. But what I asked these students to do was to, I asked them these four questions. Right? And you guys can ask yourselves these questions as, I, as we go through this. You're not going to, you don't have to answer it. But what's the best experience you've ever had as an employee? So I'd ask the students that, and they would think about it, and they would tell me something. And I would probe, you know, so really? Why was that so bad? How did it make you feel? Those kinds of questions. And then I would ask them, what's the worst experience you've ever had as an employee? How did that make you feel? What's the best experience they had ever had as a customer? What's the worst experience that they uh, had ever had as a customer? And this was a business, right? I was applying for a business position, so I used the business context. But you could change this around. You could talk about experiences as a patient, healthcare patient, or um, uh, an, an experience uh, in an interaction with someone, a public authority of some kind, right? Um, but, you know, the students, we would, we would work through this, and, you know, I would put their responses up on the board, and I was trying to get to the bottom of this. Why was this a best experience, and why was this the wor uh, worst experience, right? And as it turns out, and I have done this lots of times, I actually have done this in some of the liberal arts institutes that we used to have in the summer here. Uh, do the same exercise, but I've done it in companies, and it never fails, all right? What's at the root of these experiences is whether someone was treated with respect or not. Whether someone's dignity was either affirmed or assaulted. And I would bet that the same this experience applies to everybody in the room today. Right? And so, um, you know, uh, just lost, lost, finally lost my thought. <laughs> um, so it comes down, oh, so what I ended up telling the students is, this is great, because you now already know the single most important thing to know about management, right? You don't mess with people's dignity. In fact, you do everything you can do to affirm their dignity. And the same is true in almost any endeavor um, that we undertake. And as I say, in my book, um, you know, the liberal arts experience reifies and embodies this human dignity. This is really what, what we, this is really the work we do at Maryville College. It's all about this. So, um, this is how I've understood my work in my life at Maryville College. Um, <clears throat> so never forget Right? We hold each other's dignity in our hands, always. So thank you guys for 24 years, and let's go next door. <laughs>